Hello there. Welcome to the Potter's Wheel. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is George Osmus. I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Americans seem to be bred to love the mavericks, the untamable ones who live by their own rules and do things their own way. We love the movies about the loose cannons who defy authority, yet still seem to get the job done by the time the credits roll. I could list example after example of movies and television shows, but you know what I'm talking about. The loose cannon trope has its place in the realm of fiction, but would you really want to go into combat with one of these guys? You know, Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Do you think he's looking for mavericks and loose cannons? Or might he be looking for a company of people who know how to keep ranks? We'll answer those questions on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work, Chief among them is the Potter's Wheel. If you are surprised by the notion that the Bible has a lot to say about submission to authority, you might want to show up for Sunday services a little more often. In Scripture, we are told to submit to the authority of God, of church leadership, of civil government, and of our employers. The Bible also makes it clear that there is a war going on in the spirit realm and that we are directly involved in it. That war between darkness and light manifests itself in our world in politics and hot button social issues. We are called to be involved in that war, but in submission to the Lord. He doesn't want us going off on our own tangent, doing our own thing. Uh, we, he wants to be the ones leading us and directing us in the battle. And today's clip is going to demonstrate the consequences of being a loose cannon. I think we all, myself included, need to pay attention and take this lesson to heart. You know, it's been said that a smart person learns from his own mistakes, but a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. Well, here's an opportunity to get a little wisdom for your life from the mistake of a certain Jedi Knight. This clip comes from Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones, directed by George Lucas and starring Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi and Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. To set the stage, Obi-Wan and Anakin have trailed the treacherous Count Dooku to his hideout. They have him cornered and they're closing in. Let's see what happens. You're gonna pay for all the Jedi that you killed today, Dooku. We'll take him together. You're going slowly on the left. Taking now! No, Anakin, no! No! <laughs> As you see, my Jedi powers are far beyond yours. Now, back down. I don't think so. Master Kenobi, you disappoint me. Yoda holds you in such high esteem. Surely you can do better. I am a slow learner. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's take a moment to interpret the symbols in the clip. Obi-Wan Kenobi represents a mature Christian leader, a pastor or elder. Anakin Skywalker represents an immature believer. Count Dooku represents an unclean spirit or demonic entity. Now, as we saw, Skywalker disobeys Kenobi and rushes in to attack the more powerful Dooku. His impetuousness costs him his arm and nearly costs both their lives. Instead of a quick end to the war, which they could have had, the enemy escapes and is allowed to continue to wreak havoc in the Republic. Now, as I read the Bible, I don't see much evidence that Jesus has a use for loose cannons. He's looking for people who will look to him for guidance. He wants an army that will keep ranks. God treated Israel the same way. Following the exodus from Egypt, God led his people on an 11-day journey to the promised land of Canaan. They had seen him destroy the army of Egypt on their behalf. They had also seen many other mighty works through that 11-day journey. Now they stand on the cusp of their destiny, and it is time to go in and take the land of Canaan. You know the story. Moses sends spies into the land, and ten of them come back with an evil report. That bad report robs the people of their courage, and they refuse to go in. Fed up with the faithlessness of his chosen people, God announces his intention to utterly destroy Israel and to make a new nation out of Moses. Moses intercedes, and God instead sentences that generation to wander the desert until they die. Well, this sentence causes some of them to find their courage again, though they still have a lot to learn about obeying God. They decide, a little too late, that they should go ahead and launch an invasion of Canaan. Moses tells them in no uncertain terms that God is not with them, and if they go ahead, they will be defeated. Well, they big fat did it anyway. And what do you know? God's word came to pass. The Amalekites and the Canaanites rout the Israeli army and send them scurrying into the desert with their collective tail between their legs. Here we have a chance to show ourselves wise by learning from the mistakes of Israel. When God says, go, you go. When he says, stay, you stay. The next generation of Israelites learned from their father's mistakes. No doubt, growing up wandering in the desert, listening to your parents' generation drone on and on, telling the stories of their own faithlessness and how their current wanderings were a punishment from God for their disobedience, probably helped. But eventually, under Joshua, Israel gets another shot at Canaan. This time, they were to go up against the city of Jericho. God gave Joshua the battle plan. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Now, put yourself in the position of the average foot soldier. The walls of Jericho were legendary for their time. The Bible says they held chariot races on top of them, so they were obviously sturdy and very thick and wide, so wide that two chariots could run side by side with room to spare. See, they have to be able to run side by side, or it's not a race, it's follow the leader. So think about what, he, think about what that conversation was like. You want us to march around the city? Yes. Once a day for six days? Yes. On the seventh day, we march around seven times? Yes. Then the priests are going to blow the trumpet. Yes. And we're going to shout. Yes. 
and the walls are going to fall down flat. You've got it. We're doomed. But here's the thing. God is looking for obedience, isn't he? In his rebuke of King Saul, Samuel said, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Joshua could have yielded to carnal wisdom and sacrificed perhaps the entire army of Israel trying to take Jericho with conventional means. But Joshua had a more excellent spirit. Joshua spent 40 years wandering in the desert, watching an entire generation pay the price for their lack of faith. Even in the Old Testament, they knew that faith without works is dead. If you say you believe, then when God speaks, you move. If you call Him Lord, then you do the things He says. Well, you know how it turned out. Joshua and the army obeyed God, and just like he said, the walls fell and Jericho was conquered. Unfortunately, their follow-up was a little bit lacking in the faithful obedience department. The next city was Ai. Joshua sent spies out who looked the situation over and said, Oh, they ain't nothing. We can whoop them. No need to send the whole army. Just two or three thousand should do it. Well, what the spies didn't know and what Joshua didn't know because he didn't ask was that there was a curse on the army because this one old boy named Achan had decided that God's command to take none of the spoil from Jericho just didn't apply to him. He despised the command of God and took silver, some clothing, and some other stuff that God said they weren't supposed to take. Achan's disobedience robbed Israel of the presence of God in the battle, and, well, they got whooped. Nowhere do I see that Joshua sought the Lord for a battle plan for Ai in the first attack. Perhaps if he had exercised the same wisdom at Ai that he had at, that he had at Jericho, the Lord would have told him not to go up until this Achan business was taken care of. We'll never know. Once Achan's sin was exposed, Joshua had him stoned to death. Apparently, they didn't have any of this easier to get forgiveness than permission stuff in their culture. He then got some more divine strategy from the Lord for how to conquer Ai. I have to wonder if King Solomon, who had no doubt heard the stories of Moses and Joshua and the conquest of Canaan all of his life, had this in mind when he wrote Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. We're going to pause now for a few words from Potter's Wheel Films. When we come back, we'll talk about the importance of obedience in the life of a New Covenant believer. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you think a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Wheel Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies that preach the gospel, demonstrate biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with your digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to put our tools and talent to work for you to expand your audience and increase your ministry's impact on the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email at potterswheelfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. Welcome back. You know, it's true that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead on the third day for our justification. For the genuine believer in Jesus Christ, that truth inspires us to turn from our sin. If you find that you're not having that reaction, I urge you once again to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Jesus expects obedience from His followers, plain and simple. His death, burial, and resurrection was never intended to be a license for us to live as we please, even though some high-dollar preachers might tell you otherwise. I can hear some of you out there getting ready to whip out the old, Judge not lest ye be judged on me. 
well, that's fine. You play the game the way you want. But I would encourage you to read just a little bit farther in Matthew 7. Get past that part that you think justifies your sin and lets you live as you please. And get all the way down to verse 21 and 23, where Jesus, you know, the Mr. Love and Acceptance, Mr. Forgives All Sin, says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." Obedience matters to Jesus. When the Jews accused him of breaking the Sabbath, Jesus explained to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So Jesus was literally obeying God in everything that he did, even the weird stuff. Now, what do I mean by weird stuff? Well, let's consider a couple of notable miracles from the Gospel of John. You all know the story from John 2 about the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Apparently, the family had never heard it said, prior planning prevents poor performance. Because in the middle of the festivities, they ran out of wine. Jesus' mother brings him the report, they have no wine. What I want you to see is that Jesus was there at the wedding. He was present, yet the wine ran out. He was in the house, yet they ran out of something vital that they needed for their celebration. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but Jesus' presence in your life does not preclude the possibility of calamity coming your way. This is still a fallen world, and bad things still happen, even when Jesus is in the house. But when they happen, isn't it comforting to know that you can call on him just like Mary did? And you all know the story. The servants brought out six water pots, filled them with water. When they drew it out and took it to the master of the feast, it had been made wine. And not just wine, but the best wine. When the wine runs out in your life, I want you to remember this. God always saves the best wine for last. Later on in John 9, Jesus heals a blind man by spitting on the ground, making clay out of it, and rubbing it in the man's eyes. That's pretty gross, right? <laughs> I mean, definitely qualifies as weird. But that is what Jesus saw his father doing for that man at that time. Jesus was an obedient son, and he always did what he saw the father doing. That blind man, heeding Jesus' instruction, washed in the pool of Siloam and received his sight. Matthew tells us about a time when Jesus sent his disciples out in a boat while he closed the service. The wind was contrary, as Matthew put it, and they were basically stuck in the middle of the lake. Jesus didn't have a jet ski, so how's he going to catch up to them? Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now the disciples had watched Scooby-Doo, so they knew how to handle this situation. <laughs> So the ghost. Peter had the best solution. Watch this, guys. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. <laughs> That'll show him. And the Lord said, come. Ooh, bluff called, fisherman. To his credit, Peter did manage to get out of the boat and do a little water walking, but his natural mind got the better of him. I can't fault him, though. I mean, he got farther than I would have in that same situation. Another New Testament guy who knew how to keep ranks was Ananias of Damascus. Now, this isn't the same Ananias who schemed with his wife to lie to the Holy Spirit and paid a pretty hefty price for it. No, this is the guy who, he's just sitting in his house one day, having his prayer time with the Lord, and suddenly he hears this. Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Ananias replied the way many of us would have, I think. What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> have you ever looked at the maps in the back of the Bible? If you look back there, you'll see that Damascus is roughly 100 miles from Jerusalem. 
A hundred miles. Now think about this. In a time before newspapers, before radio, before television, before the internet, before Facebook, there really was such a time, believe it or not. The man Saul of Tarsus was so well known for his persecution of the church of Jesus Christ that a man who lived a hundred miles away had heard of him. That's pretty amazing to me. Now Paul himself confessed that he was very zealous in his persecution of the church prior to his conversion. But for Ananias to hear of it in Damascus, his zeal must have been legendary. Try this test. Think of a town that is about 100 miles away. Now, real quick and without consulting Google or Siri or Alexa, what's the name of the mayor of that town? You probably don't know, do you? Get the point? Ananias, despite his fear and trepidation, was still a good soldier of the Lord. He obeyed the call, went to Judas' house, laid hands on Saul, and Saul was healed. Good thing, too, because as you all know, Saul of Tarsus would later become the Apostle Paul, who was largely responsible for the spread of Christianity in the Gentile world and wound up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. It's kind of hard to imagine what Christianity would look like today without his service to the Lord, wouldn't you say? When Jesus had John the Revelator write to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, his evaluation of each church began with one statement, I know your works. Not your heart, your works. Paul shows us in 1 Corinthians 3 that our lives will be judged by our works, not by our heart. We're judged by what we actually do, not by our intentions. You may have heard the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I'm here to tell you that whoever coined that phrase knew what they were talking about. The American church is in far greater danger than they realize, and the danger is coming from within. I just read an article today that said that less than half of the pastors in the U.S. believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. We need to get serious about our walk with the Lord, church. We need to get serious about a cleansing and cleaning house from the pulpit to the pews and back again and remove the false disciples, the false apostles, the wolves in sheep's clothing from our midst. We've got to get on message and stay on message. And that message is not, forgive me, live your best life now. That message is be about your father's business. That message is about, be, about going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. That message is about making disciples of all nations. It is time for this Peter Pan church to grow up. Our time is almost up, so I'll leave you with a couple of parting thoughts. At the end of the day, the Lord is looking for people who will walk in His will and do life His way. He really has no use for the rebels and the mavericks. He doesn't think it's cool when we mess up His plans by doing things our own way. As Christians, we all, me included, shall be making it our aim to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. As we all know, without faith, it is impossible to please him. In the Star Wars universe, Anakin Skywalker was a powerful Jedi who could do a lot of cool things through the Force. But he was also a deeply flawed individual who had serious issues with pride and authority. He frequently thought more highly of himself than he should and constantly chafed under the authority of the Jedi Council. We can learn a lot from his mistakes and from those of Israel in the Old Testament. Our natural tendency is to look for the quick and easy path, but Jesus said that the quick and easy path leads to death, while the narrow and difficult way is the way of life. I think Yoda would agree. If you end your training now, if you choose the quick and easy path, as Vader did, you will become an agent of evil. The Bible also says that there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is death. Remember that James gave us a strategy for dealing with the spiritual battles we face. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. These steps work when we take them in faith and when we do them in the proper order. Believing is one thing, but that belief must eventually lead us to obeying the word of God, or it is of no use at all. Let's close in prayer. 
Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come before your throne, to lay our lives down and to celebrate uh, our, our relationship with you and our status as covenant children, as the sheep of your fold, citizens of your kingdom, and covenant members of your household. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and to study your word. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would minister life to those who are watching this program and joining with me in prayer. Father God, I ask for all of us, Lord God, to leave behind the elemental things of childhood, to leave behind, Lord, the baby state where salvation is all about me and grow up into the mature disciples that you have called us to be. Lord, you said that they are the sons of God who are led by the Spirit of God as opposed to our own flesh or the spirits of this age. Lord, help us, God, to walk in your will and in your ways. Jesus, you said that your sheep know your voice and it's strangers they would not follow. So give us grace, Lord, to filter out, Lord, all the lying voices, Lord, that would... Uh, that would come to steal and kill and destroy and give us ears to hear your voice, Father, above all the other voices that surround us and are calling and clamoring for our attention. Lord, help us to follow that still, small voice of the Lord that leads us in triumph, Father God, and that we would fulfill your call on our life in Jesus' name. God bless.